Hey dreamers and welcome to Dreamers Unite, the talk show for dreamers. I am your host Sherry Pullum and I thank you for joining me. On this channel, well, we unpack our dreams. No dream is too big or too small. I interview guests from all walks of life, some celebrities, and I like to say maybe even your next door neighbor. We do everything we can to help you to reach your goal, to reach your vision, to help that dream to manifest in the world. And today I have a filmmaker who has done just that. He has lived many of his dreams and I'm sure he has so many more on the horizon. His name is Mustafa Khan. He is an Emmy award-winning filmmaker and television director. And let me tell you a little bit more about him. Mustafa Khan is an Emmy award-winning American director of uniquely inspiring narrative, documentary, and television films. Some of his credits include Rocksteady, a coming-of-age action movie, House on Fire, an award-winning documentary about the AIDS epidemic in Black America, 20 years of original films and specials for Sesame Street and other children's television shows, and his breathtaking film, Reflections of a Native Son, which is on permanent display at the American Museum of Television and Radio. Mustafa's passion and enthusiasm for film know no bounds as he continues living his dream and illuminating what's inside of us all through his cinematic artistry. And his recent project, Song for Our People, has won a number of film festival awards. So without further ado, I bring you this filmmaker and television director, extraordinaire, Mustafa Khan. Mustafa, welcome to Dreamers Unite. I am so happy to have you as my guest. Thank you. Sure, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you so much. I know you have an incredible journey and I want you to share it with um, our audience. Sure, well, um, my, uh, my journey started in Camden, New Jersey, where I grew up. Um, and uh, lived in Camden and Cherry Hill with my parents and a uh, pretty large family. Uh, my, uh, you know, came from a, a family of a lot of achievers and a lot of community oriented people and very uh, positive people in a lot of ways. So um, my father was a, you know, family doctor in Camden. My mother was a nurse. Both of them were community activists. My uncles were community activists and Tuskegee Airmen. And so there was a, um, a big, uh, ethos in my family that we're here to give back and we're here to achieve, we're here to excel mm -hmm. and, uh, and to uh, uplift our people um, in everything we do. So, uh, so I grew up in Southern New Jersey, um, went off to college uh, in, when I was 17, um, studied comparative religion, developmental psychology, uh, thought I would uh, go into medical school uh, like my dad. Um, but got interested uh, more in uh, anthropological work and psychological anthropology and um, started uh, really focusing on comparative religion and developmental psychology, uh, which I studied as an undergrad. But I always also uh, did a lot of still photography and directed theater, which was part of my uh, family background as well. It's the other family business. Uh, my um, oldest brother, Ricardo, is... Um, Crossroads Theater. He started that theater company in New Jersey as well. So he was a director who always influenced me as well. So um, I did a fellowship for a year in uh, Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, I had a Rotary Fellowship and uh, lived overseas for a year, uh, studying people's lives, studying uh, different tribes' um, lives, uh, Samburu and Maasai in particular in, uh, in, in uh, Eastern Africa. And, um, and then got to kind of travel around the world, come back, worked as an anthropologist for a year or so, thought I'd go do a PhD at Columbia at the time, and uh, decided to defer my admission for a year um, to try to see if I could make any headway making films. And um, I just had this crazy idea that if I um, could make films about people's lives rather than write about them academically, uh, I could reach even more people and affect them in a, in a different kind of way, the way that film mm -hmm. does. 
Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, just by chance, uh, one day I ran into an old buddy of mine from college, Reggie Hudland, Reginald Hudland, who was uh, a year ahead of me in college. And he was the only black filmmaker that I knew and who was, you know, happening at the time. Uh, right at that time, and, and you know, I mean, Spike had been, you know, being famous, yeah. and a lot of other black filmmakers. Yeah. Um, and I asked uh, Reggie, I said, you know, I'm really thinking of getting this film thing. And he just looked at me and smiled and said, come on in, brother, the water's fine. Wow. Yeah. And from that point on, I said, well, why not, why not go for your dreams? Uh, so I um, enrolled in a film program at NYU. Uh, study film, sort of an intensive uh, filmmaking program. I was lucky because I, I directed theater before and I also knew still photography very well and lighting. So uh, the principles of cinematography are very, basically the same as, 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 as photography. Um, so after I finished that program, I just by chance, uh, had a chance meeting with Spike Lee. Um, what happened was she's got a habit had just come out and um, I was doing some consulting with uh, Susan Taylor over at Essence Magazine. And because um, I had been writing a lot about um, young black men in particular and different self-destructive behaviors, mm -hmm. uh, sort of from a more of an anthropological and a public health point of view. Um, and I was kind of established in that area. And that's what I was doing a PhD in. And uh, walking out of uh, Susan Taylor's office uh, one day, Spike is walking in and she said, you know, in her elegant way, you know, Mustafa Khan, Spike Lee, Spike Lee, Mustafa Khan. And it's just, ah. <laughs> How you doing? And uh, I and I told him the exact same thing. You know, I was thinking of getting into film. He goes, "Well, give me a call. Work on my next gig." And I was like, "Okay, I'll work on your next gig." And that was school days. And so right like that, I worked on my next gig, um, which was school days. I rented my apartment and went down to Atlanta, and it was just heaven on earth. You know, it was you know black filmmakers mm -hmm. and actors and crew and making movies, shooting film, really professional, really, really well done. And uh, I was like, I like this. This is really, really nice. So um, after working with Spike, I worked um, as a production assistant initially, and but I knew camera and, and, and editing. So I worked in those departments as well. Um, and then, uh, and then um, started, you know, I, I needed another gig, you know, after that. And I, uh, and a friend of mine, from film school had said, well, they're hiring PAs to work in commercials for hundred bucks a day or 125 bucks a day. And that was a ton of money to me at that time. So I said, sure, let's do it. Um, and, uh, and then I got on the set and I realized, well, this isn't brain surgery. I would know how to do this, you know? And I, cause I didn't have enough money to then make my own film at that point. I wanted mm -hmm. to make documentaries and I had this crazy dream of doing that. And I kind of knew I had the tools to do it, but, um, but just didn't have the money to do it necessarily. So after working as a PA for a little while, I realized that it wasn't brain surgery. And I came up with this idea to, um, to basically make some spec commercials, commercials on speculation um, with whatever material and film that my friends could beg, borrow and steal. Uh, and, um, and basically, you know, got all this free equipment and free film and shot uh, some commercials some fake commercials over, over a weekend. And, um, and the oddest thing is that I'm working as a PA and I, uh, it takes me a few months to then get the money to get the film out of the lab and to edit it and all the rest. So, but when I did, I sent it around all the people that I had, um, I had worked with and they had all said to me nicely, oh, you want to be a director? Well, give me a call when you have something, you know, kind of thing. And I was like, you know, people just being nice, but I did give them a call. And uh, it just so happened that you have to be lucky to in this business. And it just so happened that there was a SAG strike going on, a Screen Actors School strike going on right at the time when my spec commercials were all ready. So I had a new fresh reel out of a director no one's ever heard of before that got out there in the commercial world that had you know, some spots on that people thought were kind of stylish and kind of cool. And, um, and I was driving a truck you know, for, uh, you know, for a production company and I, you know, get calls to say, hey, listen, we want you to come in and talk to us. And I thought, oh my goodness, okay, they're calling me for another PA job. And I walk into a production company and a very fancy company that's part of Richard Branson's company with Virgin, you know, Atlantic and Virgin Image. Um, and uh, it was his production company and the head producer wanted to talk to me. And he said, I've seen your stuff. You're great. He goes, but I hear you're talking to this other company. What's it going to take for you to direct for us. And I was like, um, then I named some 
ridiculously low figure. And they go, done, you're on. We'll guarantee you that amount of money, quit all your other jobs, you're with us. And that was it. So it was within a week time, I was signed as a director. And this is when I was 23, 24. And uh, all of a sudden I'm a signed professional, you know, director's guild director. And I start making, uh, making TV commercials from there. And, uh, you know, first big commercials were, well, with Bill Cosby, who I didn't know was bad Bill at the time, but, you know, um, got hired to do Coca-Cola commercials and Burger King and all these large commercials and then music videos. And I just, things just kept, kept rolling. And um, by um, about a year later, one of my commercials that I did were about young people, which is near and dear to my heart. So, um, so lo and behold, Sesame Street had seen my stuff and called me after that and just said, hey, whatever you want to make for us, we'll give you money to go make. And um, then I, uh, which was wonderful. So I got to you know, start writing music and producing music along with my films for Sesame Street because I just decided to create funky things for them. Um, I, my first, real movie was a, a film called Reflections of a Native Son, which uh, the company that I was with um, had a contract with PBS to, uh, to do a, a series of short films called Imagining America, part of a larger uh, series. Mm -hmm. And they asked different filmmakers to make different takes on American life. And that was, and, and I had been you know, studying, you know, young brothers, you know, um, you know, who were sort of in dead end situations. Right. And uh, for a while, and then um, I said, well, this is a film I want to make. And so I made the film and called Reflections of a Native Son. And it um, ended up, you know, getting a lot of critical acclaim. And it's in the oh. Museum of Television and Radio now and on permanent display and stuff like that. So things just started rolling and I haven't, haven't looked back since. Wow, I told you the journey Dreamers was incredible or is incredible. Okay, what I first want to do is see if I can receive some of that energy <laughs> um, through the, and, and let me throw all that out to the Dreamers because you got the right, yeah, you got the right energy on you, you know, definitely an anointing for Thank sure. You. Thank you. Yeah, and certainly, um, divine design right you know i don't i don't question it not about me it's about trying to do good work and represent our people well so are you living your dream you always you have so many interests i i i feel like i'm living my dream absolutely you know and um it's uh you know one of the things that i thought about um in uh when i was in in, in film school and talked to another filmmaker about uh, another film student about was that, you know, we, we both had said to ourselves, you know, if we can just literally just, we don't have to be super rich and famous, but if we can make a living making films mm -hmm. and make a living making the kinds of films that we want to make, you've won, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you just get a chance to, you know, enjoy your path along the way, enjoy all the people you meet along the way, which is really what it's about, you know, all the people you meet, and, and all the adventures you have, um, that's what you really take with you. And some of my very uh, best friends that I've had for you know now all my career uh, have been ones that I knew when I was very young and just pursuing dreams. And so um, yeah, never give up on your dreams. You know, it's uh, and and you also never know what where an opportunity is going to take you. You know, or where that opportunity is going to going to going to come from. Um, but I've learned that if you're just present for it and prepared and focused um, to, uh, and just keep your eyes open, you know, and open to the opportunities that are there, uh, you know, sometimes what, you know, sometimes good things will come. Yes. Okay, uh, Mustafa, on this show, I catch nuggets from people. Present, prepared, and focused. That's a huge nugget right there. I'm gonna catch it from you and I throw it literally out to my dreamers. Wonderful. Be present, prepared, and focused. Boom, take that nugget dreamers. Yeah. Present, prepared, and focused from Mustafa Khan. That is some really great advice. And sometimes I like to just say offerings. Yeah. <laughs> a good offering. So do you feel any pressure after winning an Emmy, after a certain amount of success? Do you feel pressure now on your um, next project? I, 
I, I don't feel pressure from the point of view of an Emmy Award. I won an Emmy when I was very young. I mean, it's 20, 27, I guess, when I, when I uh, was nominated and won my first Emmy. I've been nominated for a couple after that as well. Um, and, uh, and so I, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, but as far as pressure is concerned, it's more a pressure that I put on myself. You know, like, like in my film, it's all about living up to, you know, your potential mm -hmm. and living up to um, what, you know, taking the most advantage of what your ancestors and parents have passed on to you, you know? And so my biggest fear is squandering opportunities. Mm -hmm. My biggest fear is not being grateful and not being able to take advantage of situations that my ancestors and predecessors have worked really hard for me to have. Um, so that's kind of where I feel pressure, more the self-pressure. Um, the other thing is that one of the other ways that pressure can manifest itself is when you don't listen to the voice inside you. When you, when you accept other people's definitions of success for yourself, and which is which is you know easy to do because you know we're surrounded by this media that says you're supposed to be this, you're supposed to be that. But when you could get back to what matters to yourself, that's what matters the most. That's where you're going to be happiest. That's where you need to be. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, while I was making Sesame Street films and the other stuff I was making in my you know, late twenties, early thirties, I got approached from Hollywood to make, you know, to make you know, the next violent you know, inner city hood movie, you know, gang banging movie and stuff like that, which just, just wasn't what I was about. You know, I would read the scripts and I would have the meetings and sort of talk to them about it. But, you know, when it became really clear that all they were interested in is, you know, having, you know, some black folks shooting each other and, and mm -hmm. acting cool and, you know, they're gonna make a lot of money off it and we're all white executives, quite, quite frankly, you know, doing that, I was like, eh, I'd rather stay here and do that. You know, I'd rather stay in New York and do my own thing. Um, so again, you know, is there pressure then to say, oh, I should be more famous or I should make this more famous movie or whatever it might be. Then I realized that, you know, you want to pursue your happiness, you know, and you're never going to have that time again. And, you know, if you go to make a movie and you're depressed the whole time on the film, maybe it's prestigious or it gets out there, but, you know, you're not enjoying your life. You're not really giving to people what you want to be given to people and getting back what you want to be getting back, then, then that's not a place to be. So I've tried in my life to make good decisions and to be deliberative about making decisions. And again, focused on making decisions and then, and then, and then making that decision cleanly, you know, um, and then not looking back at that point. So, you know, a lot of times, I mean, that's sort of served me well so far because I've been a happy person, uh, thank God. Um, but, you know, getting on a project or, or pursuing an avenue that really just isn't you mm -hmm. because you just think that's what you're supposed to do or that's what you have access to do and that's what other people would want to do, um, but you don't really want to do it, that, that, that is something that I feel self-pressure about. So to be able to hear your own voice and hear what matters to you and to, and to pursue the path that, 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 that matters to you. Sometimes it takes quieting your mind and quieting your brain from all the other clutter that's out there and think back to yourself and just think, why am I doing what I'm doing? What would make me happiest to do right now? Why am I here? You know, what am I called to do in this situation or called to do as a filmmaker? So for me, what often centers me is when I think about my father, I think about my father and mother, you know, and I think to myself, okay, I am doing this instead of treating the sick and poor in Camden, New Jersey, you know? You know, I need to at least feed and touch people as much as my dad did, you know, and, you know, to just live up to my potential. You know, so what I try to do as a filmmaker is similar to what, you know, people talk about ministry, you know, it's, it's sort of a ministry to me, you know, you're, 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 you're serving others in the work that you're doing. So when I recenter in that way, um, I could always sort of find my way. 
Yeah, I believe that too. Um, that it is about listening to your own voice and your own calling. And success is defined by each individual person. Yeah. And I do agree with you. Too often we look, well, we're, we're conditioned that way, right? Too often we're conditioned to believe acquiring more things or doing this by a certain age or having this certain number in the bank account or whatever it is that we're told defines us as successful people sometimes we have bought into how do you you've did, done a little bit of i mean a lot of defining i think what success means to you but in a nutshell i'm sure you probably feel successful i hope you do because i think you are i hope you do um do you feel successful and how do you define success for yourself well um I think of the moments that give me some of the most fulfillment, you know, and when I think of that, I think of hearing somebody sing a song that I wrote, you know, or talking to somebody who saw a film that I made and they went, Oh man, I love that. That just made me feel so connected. And, you know, you know, then, you know, you're doing the right thing. Or when I see the light bulb go off in my students' eyes and they are just fulfilled from, you know, from this career that they decided to pursue because I've nudged them in that direction or, or they learned something that, um, that I've had, to, you know, to have a huge influence on somebody like that on their lives, that feels like success to me. <sighs> um, you know, to be able to, um, to be able to also, um, you know, send somebody a film and they go, well, what are you all about? And to be able to make a film that tells people what I'm all about in a way that's more eloquent than my words, um, that's artistically successful to me, you know? So, um, so, you know, I don't always feel that way, but I, um, I feel fulfilled that that happens enough that um that it keeps me going and uh, and you know i want to tell you know you always want to do more you always want to tell the next story and everything like that um and you feel like your time's running out sometimes you know especially when you get older and your friends that are dying and you know yeah. all this stuff you go hmm, what you know what can i do but you want to be able to um you want to be able to touch people and you really want to be able to have people um, have had a, had a difference made in their lives because of what you've done. And when you see that, and when you can see that, that feels like success to me. Really and truly to be able to deliver um, a message and to move people in such a way, I agree with you, that is I think too, like the pinnacle of success, right? Yeah. If you could brighten the world a little, you know, and yeah. bring that light wherever you go, it's it's a wonderful thing to be doing. It's a good thing. Well, you can tell just by looking at you anyway, that you have a bright light, a huge spirit. You have a great big smile. I mean, you smile, it feels like the whole world is smiling back at you. Well, that's a nice feeling, I hope so. When I see you smile, you can't, you can't help but smile. So you must have some, challenging times in your life. Um, and I like to talk about the things that are inspiring, but also talk about those moments that are real to us in life and how do we get through them? Because we need the encouragement and we need examples from others for us to get through challenging times. So what has been maybe one of your most challenging times and how did you get, how did you overcome it? Well, pro probably the most um, probably one of the most challenging times in my life was uh, my uh, teenage years, um, and um, and it was uh, difficult for a number of reasons, but mostly family reasons. And then um, and then 
I, uh, as a teenager, um, I don't know if you know this, but I was a, a teenage preacher. I was a uh, ordained minister as a, as a kid. Um, and um, in a way that, you know, was not always positive, you know, um, it, it could be very positive and some things about it were, but um, it, it was a difficult, difficult time. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I remember just, uh, you know, being very troubled by sort of a very strict fundamentalist way of looking at the world. Um, and because it didn't make sense to me, it had some cognitive dissonance and stuff like that. And I remember uh, running into, um, when I was visiting colleges and I, I, I went off and I, I, I met a brother who was there at, at, at one place and, um, and, he, and what, what he said really stuck with me because I was trying to figure out, you know, um, you know, how to reconcile all these thoughts and feelings and, you know, also feeling, you know, not being able to feel that bad for myself through the personal pain that I was going through um, because I was so much luckier than so many other people I grew up with, you know, and, and, and everything like that. And he just looked at me and I, and, 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 and I said, well, brother, what about this? What about this? He goes, but, but you got to understand God is bigger than that. Mm. And I said, well, but, but what about this verse in the Bible that says, no, he goes, well, but God is bigger than that, you know, and God is bigger than that which we can conceive. That's the whole point that we don't understand it all, that you don't have to know all the answers. And as a teenager, I felt like I did need to know all the answers. I was a minister and I was having doubt. Um, I was an adolescent. I was having pain because I didn't have friends because I was a reverend and, you know, all these things. And, and, and you know, just those words of love that, you know, someone might, look at you, you know, got, you know, people might bring angels into your life. You might have angels come into your life and, 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 and just give you a bit of wisdom that then opens up some light. And so the whole idea that the world is, um, is a big place. You don't have to know all the answers, you know, but you know that love is the answer and love is much bigger than all of us. And that really helped me get through to know that the universe was, was bigger, to know that, um, you know, it could be okay. I don't know if that really answered your question, but- Yes, it did answer my question. And I, you know, wholeheartedly feel that love is the answer and the key to really everything. Yeah. Um, it ain't that deep, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know that's it love love, know, is the answer. love is really the answer as i've interviewed a number of different guests and we talk about you know why is it so difficult for us to love ourselves i mean because that's really where it starts right is it starts within and when you don't love self yeah. um the creation that god made us to be um and just love every part of us we're not going to be perfect we are not perfect and we have to learn to accept it's okay you know we're going to make mistakes Absolutely. learn from those lessons that's okay but we are also and and i believe you know we're we're beings we're spiritual beings and it is difficult as you say it's a kind of the push pull because we are in a material world yeah. right yeah. so it's figuring out how can we be our best selves with all the love that we have inside of us? Yeah. You know, and it, it, it is simple, but there are times, let's face it, <laughs> it becomes a challenge at times, especially when we allow ego. Um, in this industry in particular, it's filled with a lot of egos. Um, and I think just the world, period. But at the end of the day, I do agree with you. You did answer it. I think you turn to love. Yeah. And that's a healing force. Absolutely. Yeah. So. And to be able to see love in, in everything and every culture, you know, um, I think really, uh, really gets you through. You know, I went to Quaker schools uh, growing up. And one thing that the Quakers had always said is uh, there's that of God in every person. Look for it.
Thou of God in every person, look for it. Yeah. Here you go, dreamers. Yeah. It's just an offering. I don't even know, throw that at you. Not a problem. It's an offering. Yeah. Mustafa. You try to see what's beautiful inside people. You try to, you know, and if you don't see it right away, well, right away, then you keep looking, you know, because it might be there. You know, and, 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 and if you do try to bring that out, you bring out the best in everybody, then you always get this positive energy from whomever you meet. You know, it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's a strange thing, but it really does, it does work. You know, there is, you know, people who are miserable don't always want to be miserable. Uh -oh. you know? And there, there are things in them that there is some light in them. So if you could help bring that light out, then you bask in that light too. That's so true. You can be the light in someone else's dark corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And that's, yeah. and that's why we're here, you know, right in the corner where you are. What do you think is the responsibility of black filmmakers now, or is there a responsibility to create our stories. And if we don't tell our stories, do you think they can be authentically told by others? Well, it's a, it's a good question. Um, the first part of the question is, is, is it our responsibility to tell our stories? Absolutely. I think, uh, I think we, if, if, if we're in this privileged position, to have this megaphone artistically and from a communications point of view to put a story out into the world, then, you know, we have a responsibility to tell stories that aren't being told. And mm -hmm. usually those are stories that are about our own experiences that we could tell from a certain perspective that are not being told. So absolutely, I think we have a real responsibility to do that. Um, can, I, I can't really say that absolutely nobody else could tell a story of ours about black folks except being black. Right. I think somebody who's black is going to have a certain perspective on it that someone who's white is not going to have. But, um, but yeah, there might be some white or other filmmakers who can make a good film about a, you know, a, about a person who's black just because we're all human. Mm -hmm. and they're a good storyteller. They should be able to tell that story from a compassionate and and, and empathetic point of view. Um, but with black filmmakers, yeah, we should just keep making films, keep telling our stories, and um, and also, you know, we could tell other people's stories. You know, there are, you know, be because we have a perspective on that. You know, we have a perspective on, you know. Black folks making films about white people could be, be from a perspective that a lot of white people don't have, you know, about themselves. That's right. And so I think it could be very eye-opening. Um, but the fact is, is that, you know, when we have the, the chance, the, the megaphone to make stories, I'd say make stories about us as much as you can, uh, because I think the world needs that. You know, it's incredible how much the rest of the world knows us by media. You know, mm -hmm. the world knows us by our music, by our films, by our television, by our styles. Um, but, you know, and, and we influence and rock the whole world in that way. So how we do that and how we put that out there is really important. And I think the diversity of voices within Black America really need to get out, you know. So there's not just one way to be Black, you know. There's, you know, there's... 50 million black folks in this country, you know, there are 50 million ways to be black. You're right, because we are not all the same in our blackness. We're not all the same. We're not all the same at all. And the more we put those diverse voices out about ourselves, the better off we are as a people and the better the world knows who we are. Because there are common things that bond us all together and bond all of us right. together. But looking at them in the aggregate, I think you get a sense of that. But individually, again, there's no one way. Um, but, uh, but this is one of the things I, I, I was trying to address in, in Song for Our People. And um, some of the lyrics that I wrote in that were, you know, there's no such thing as one way to be black, but the more one way is by giving back to our mm -hmm. brothers and sisters who have been left behind and transcending a self-centered state of mind. You know, 
because we're standing on the shoulders of our ancestors' pain. We gotta be sure they didn't struggle in vain. I wanna do what I can to properly succeed them. So starting a day, I'm doing more with my freedom. So that's the, that's the whole idea. So there is something that bonds us all together. The fact that all of us come from a heritage of people who were kidnapped, abducted, enslaved, abused, and persevered through all of that and mm. survived it mm. and came out of that, all of that survival spirit is with us. Yes. All of that perseverance and resilience is part of our DNA. So mm. the way that we look at the world is a very special way that very few other groups of people in the world look at it as survivors of that kind of abuse, you know, and yet at the same time, look at what we've created and look at what we've built and look at what we've done in spite of that experience. Um, that tells you something about the resilience of the human spirit that transcends race, but it's definitely embedded within ours. Some of the most brilliant ideas came because we didn't have the privilege. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we are some... I'm telling you, I love celebrating black people. Yeah. Yes. And I love celebrating all people. Yeah. Yes, I do. It's I a, love celebrating very... all cultures and all people. And we should be proud to be who we are and celebrate our own culture and embrace it and not be ashamed to say it. But also, yeah, and also celebrating all people. But I do love celebrating my black people too. Yeah. Like you said, we have a perspective that is uniquely ours. It's a gift, this culture that's so vibrant and, and, and a history that's um, so regal in a lot of ways and, and, yeah. and how we transcend it with our heads held high. That yeah. to be part of that is really, you know, it's, it, it's a privilege, you know, to, 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 to be part of that history, you know. So you just wanna, my feeling is you just wanna live up to that. You know, I've, I've joked around that, you know, the main thing that I want to do in life and is, uh, you know, not die and go to heaven and have, and have Harriet Tubman kick my ass. When yeah, I can't imagine Harriet Tubman. Ah, you know, I just don't want Harriet to go, hey, come here, come here, come here. What? what? <laughs> you couldn't do more than that? Yes, yeah. what? Sorry, sorry, you? man. Dang. I did drag slaves out of, out of bondage, you know, but I, I tried to do what I could. Yes, yeah, I agree. Maybe she'll just kick my ass a little, you know. And, uh, yeah, I agree. There's a responsibility that we have to our ancestors. Absolutely. There is a responsibility. Yeah. Um, what is your dream project? I have a couple dream projects. One is um, one. One is a fiction film, and one is a documentary. Uh, the fiction film is is based on uh, my growing up. It's a little more of an autobiographical film about growing up in southern New Jersey and Camden and Cherry Hill in the, uh, in the early 70s. And, um, and it's a, I, I wrote a script actually that, um, wrote a short that I wanted to expand uh, called Blanching Jimmies that is all about that experience from the point of view of a small child and from kind of a very special thing that just for a fleeting period of years, my parents kind of created and, and, and there was a world at that time that I really wanted to, uh, to show in a lot of ways. Um, you know, Song for Our People is obviously kind of an homage to my parents. Um, it's a memorial to them in a lot of ways, um, a eulogy or whatever you want to say. But it's, um, but it's not only to my parents, but it's really to um, all of our parents of that generation, you know, that we, that that generation of ancestors and, 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 you know, those folks who straddled the civil rights movement and lived through mm -hmm. civil rights, they were, you know, they were the last Jim Crow uh, generation. And we became the, the, and we are the first Jim Crow free generation in that way. And what that generation did though, was quite remarkable in a lot of ways. And what, you know, what, you know, the black folks of, of that generation did, um, you know, to achieve their own thing in so many ways and be strong through the civil rights movement, through integration and, and kind of a lot of things that they created 
were, were really quite remarkable that I'm really just beginning to appreciate now. Mm. So in some ways, you know, Song for Our People and, and Blanche and Jimmy's is really kind of a love letter to them, to their courage and resilience and for the world that they gave us. So it, it, that project is, would be just wonderful to do. Um, and then the other project is something that is more related to Song for Our People and that I wanted to, uh, and I've got to wait till COVID dies down to, to do this, um, but really to go on the road and um, take and, and, and to take music and my team of musicians with me all over the country and to try to heal America in some ways via music, you know, so to write a new uh, American songbook, you know, songs for new America that were really about what we all have in common and about really kind of appealing to the better angels of our nature and to find that common ground with, you know, white and Latino and, and all these different groups of musicians to bring them together in little towns or in small towns all over the place and to create music together and to create a track together, song together about our common dreams in each of these places. And to have like, you know, go to 12 of these, 12 different places all around the country to do that, uh, take people like Skip, Nor uh, Norman Burns and Kenny Vaughn and Omar Edwards and um, the tap dancer and all these different artists with me and, and to recruit other artists in those places of all different races to create things that, to create songs that speak to our commonality and what bonds us all together. So that would be a wonderful both music and documentary project to do, probably more of a series kind of thing, but that would be a dream to be able to go on the road and just create music and make films with people on the road all over this country and all over the world. That'd be amazing. You know what? I just want to be a part in any way I can. Sure. Okay, okay. Yeah. The, dream the Dreamers Unite crew, yeah. we want to be able to be a part because that's what we're all about. Yeah, is music to America. Yeah, it's really healing yeah. through our, um, our each individual unique gifts and then collectively celebrating our oneness, but also celebrating our differences. That's right. That's right. That's yeah. Right. And there's no yeah, better way. The table, yeah. Yeah. Then through and music. Yes. And yeah. through the arts. Um, I could literally, you're dropping so many nuggets, wisdom, just um, your kindness of all your offerings and sharing your incredible journey. Um, and story. You are such a chameleon oh. um, and, and such a gracious, humble um, person and being. Really, I'm, I'm, off, I'm just honored to have you on the show. And we've talked a number of times, but I already knew I was going to learn so much more oh, okay. um, than I had uh, from our conversations. And um, I'm grateful that you've been here. I have one more request of you. Sure, of course. Um, I am going to just ask you to complete a sentence. Okay. Before I leave this planet, I would like to... I'd like to create all the music, all the films, and all the art that I feel like I'm here to make. I want to leave it all in the field and, uh, and, and, and not leave with any regrets. To try to meet all the people that, that I could touch and that they could touch me, to have all the experiences that, um, that, would, uh, that, 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 that I'd love to have just with, with all these all different kinds of folks but I'd want to be able just to be creating all the way, all the way up to my death, you know, just be creating and then go, okay, at some point I'm done, but that's what I'm doing. I love that. And we are a community of dreamers and we are a community of affirmers. Mm. And we are going to affirm that beautiful dream with you. Thank you. Um, 
and uh, that you continue to inspire higher, continue to create and share as many stories through music and film and whatever creative ways that you so desire that it is so and it is done. Yes. Dreamers, I thank you so much again for joining me. And if you have not yet subscribed, what am I going to say? What in the world are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button. I mean, look at this rich conversation. You know, have you not been uplifted, inspired, learned something, a good takeaway? You know, this is the place really and truly that people give of their time and of themselves to help the world be a better, brighter place. So come on and subscribe. And I thank you so much, streamers, really and truly, for the time that you come and spend with me on this channel. And I will see you again next time on Dreamers Unite. Thank you again, Mr. Thank you, Sherry.